And welcome to the June and end of end of 50 year meeting of the Toronto section of the SNPT. Uh, my name is Paul Briscoe. I'm privileged to be the chair of this section. Welcome everyone to our last regular meeting of the year and what I think is going to be an exciting evening here at the CBC. You can't have a CBC evening without wearing a CBC shirt. <laughs> and I hope everybody. And it's still, yeah. Actually, this was given to me when I used to work here by somebody who really wanted it out of his closet. He even gave me the polyester blue pants, which I threw out. And to this day, I regret it because I could still wear them and they would still fit. And pretty horribly at that. Anyway, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm going to hear in a second from Paul Moser, the organizer of our two day boot camp coming up tomorrow. Hope everybody here has signed up for the boot camp. And if you're not, there is still time. We have an exciting, I think we have 22 papers over two days uh, covering UHGTV and IP infrastructure. Uh, so, pretty interesting topical areas, and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll be able to deliver some pretty good value to the attendees. So if you would like to come, you still can. There is still room. You can uh, speak to any of us on the board here. Uh, the elections for several board members just went on. I uh, would like to thank everyone who voted. Uh, everybody who was on the slate has been re-elected for another one-year term. Uh, so unfortunately, that means the board has to put up with me. Uh, but it does mean that I have some wonderful people on the board again next year to help us uh, pull up our meetings and do our stuff. So that's really good. Congratulations to all of our board members. I, I want to mention, by the way, uh, that there's no special dispensation involved to get on the SIMPTI board here in Toronto if you'd like to help us. All you really need to do is approach us and say, I'm interested, I'd like to help. And we've had a recent example of that happening. Uh, a poor, unfortunate, wandered uh, into our midst and said, gee, I'd be interested in helping. And we discussed it and had a little quick vote, and we uh, now have a new manager at large. I'd like to introduce you tonight. Uh, where is Nadja Afta? There she is. Yeah. Back in the corner. <laughs> so we have a second woman on the board, thank God. Because women think so much better than men. It's wonderful. And we really, really look forward to having Nadia participate next year and hope that she enjoys it and decides to run for an elected position on the board which is really no different than manager at large, which is unelected, you still got to do the same amount of crummy work. Same thing. <laughs> exciting, work. exciting, I'm sorry, exciting work. Anyway, speaking of crummy work, I'd like to introduce the guy who has organized the two-day boot camp, and he really has done many months of crummy work. It's a lot of organization. It's a heck of a job. Uh, our past chair, Paul Rosen. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Welcome everyone. Uh, the last few years we've sort of done, we've arranged the traditional, when we've had a boot camp that is, we've arranged our traditional barbecue uh, evening to be the kickoff to the boot camp event. And so we've done that once again this year. Everything starts off tomorrow with boot camp itself. Uh, just for those who are coming, because we sort of, I sort of sent the email out a bit late today. Um, registration starts at 8 o'clock tomorrow for anybody who might be inclined to uh, join us and you haven't signed up yet. We'll also have the coffee and uh, all this sort of refreshments starting at 8. And then uh, the, paper, the event itself starts at 9 o'clock tomorrow at Ryerson at the Berry Theatre, which is the same venue we used in the past, just across the road from uh, the Rogers Communication Centre, which is where we hold all the regular meetings. So as Paul mentioned, 22 papers and, well, a combination of papers and keynotes signed up. Um, pretty uh, jam-packed schedule. Uh, lots of great content on those topics that he mentioned. Lots of great sponsors, including our sponsor tonight, Quantum, who we had for the barbecue and for the events here, and also uh, our title sponsor, excuse me, for boot camp itself. So I'm not going to take it too much longer. We'll get right on to the, uh, the Olympic topic, but uh, hope to see you all tomorrow. Those of you who may not have registered yet, there's uh, time to just show up in the morning. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at boot camp, and have a great summer. For those of you who won't be there, we'll see you at uh, Safety in September. Thanks, Paul. So, our sponsors tonight uh, are Quantum. We'd like to thank them very much for sponsoring the meeting and the barbecue. It's our annual barbecue, and we really love to hold it. Hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you, Quantum, for that. And also thank you, CBC, for hosting the event here at the Broadcast Center and for the presentation uh, we're about to see on the Sochi Olympics. One other little thank you before I throw to our meeting organizer for the evening. Um, our Secretary Treasurer, Tony Miracker's wife, came and helped us this evening out of the blue without even being asked. So please pass thanks to Elizabeth for us all for coming and giving us a hand here. You'd have been just helpless without her, you know it. Totally. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Have a great evening. Tony Mirak.
You got no, no, but quicker to move. Oh, <laughs> okay, cool. cool. I'll try and follow you. Okay, cool. All right. So anyway, um, tonight's evening, uh, evening is going to be on the Sochi Olympics. We have got uh, both Brian uh, Johnson and uh, Rob Bunn, who are going to be doing the presentation. Um, we do the next slide. I grabbed some statistics off the internet, and I'm a believer that everything on the internet is true. So if there is something here that's wrong, <laughs> not even on the internet, because Google can only go so far. So the games were February 7th to the 23rd. It says that on the Sochi website that 450 cameras were used for the host broadcaster. 532 people were assigned to the Olympics from CBC. I'm not sure if that's the right number. 287 from uh, CBC, 144 were CBC, 106, Radio Canada, and 37, I guess, had a shared responsibilities. And 245 were uh, at the games themselves. With uh, contrast, is NBC had over 1,000 employees on site and 400 people in their Stanford, Connecticut uh, International Broadcast Center. Uh, these are interesting numbers. Uh, 250 million views on the website itself, with 380 million views from the Olympic app. So if you add those two together, that's uh, well over six, or just about six. Two and a half million downloads of the app on iOS and Android. I'm not sure, it would be interesting because it didn't drill down that far, how many iOS versus how many Androids. Um, 10.7 million Canadians watch the, uh, the Olympics <laughs> through the digital platform. And you can see the uh, number of hours of content available and 2.4 million streams for the Canada US game. Uh, that's what the app looked like uh, on the iPad or my iPad anyway. I used it religiously. It's amazing how much content that I got from the, uh, from the app. I think a lot of people got either from the app or from the da uh, from the desktop at work. So I'm sure everybody saw internet spikes at their office. And it allowed, you know, a bunch of things. You could view by channel, by sport, by day. It, it was just, it was a great app. So compliments to the people behind who did the app. So the two presenters tonight are Brian Johnson and Rob Bunn. Uh, Brian is the supervisor of media engineering, media operations and technology, English services, CBC. Rob is the team P uh, with our with media production services here in Toronto. Uh, so here's uh, Brian Johnson's uh, bio. Uh, got into engineering or is responsible for engineering CBC Sports. Um, he's got four years of responsibility with remote uh, presentation, large sporting events, and I Brian just got back from Brazil. Sure, he's got a few stories to tell there. Uh, Brian holds a BSc. I'll go back, sorry. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's his accomplishments. There's Brian. Sorry, go ahead. Yep. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> 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 at their own uh, speed. And uh, there's Rob uh, Mayo. Um, when I showed this to Elizabeth, she said 2013, 2013 ISU. Figure skating. So I thought she was going to corner you because she's really into the figure skating. She judges as well, so she's going to hound you for some information. And uh, Rob is a Ryerson grad. <laughs> so we're going to do the presentation with Rob and Brian, then we're going to have questions and answers afterwards, and then there's a door prize afterwards. So uh, the door prize, I won't tell you what it is, but it's compliments of Quantum. Staying. And it's worth staying for. So if you leave early, uh, you need to be here to win it. But it's good. So I'm going to hand it over to both Rob and Brian. I'm not sure who's going to speak first or they're going to cool, tag team. Tag team. Yeah. So I downloaded the most uh, low-resolution version of the opening I could find. 
which everyone's probably already seen. But I really like it, so I thought it was a great way to start the presentation. Really low resolution. Anything you want to mention about the production while this goes on? <laughs> I'll let it go. That's kind of that's what we opened the Olympics with. Um, it was a long time to sort of to get to that for us. Um, the there was a line here that the Olympic broadcast experience will be a nation-building event that will embrace partnerships, cross platforms, and be shared in multiple languages. And this was a internal line that was used to sort of <coughs> center us up every time we got off track, and uh, we used that to move forward. <coughs> um, the mandate that was given to production was we had a bunch of different platforms to deliver to, and as you all know, we're a multi-language nation, and so all those platforms had to be done in dual languages with the same content, and we needed to figure out an efficient, cost-effective, and try to simplify a way to do that. Um, we had uh, sub-licensees um, in the Bell uh, family and in the Rogers family. Um, and then in Montreal, we had uh, RDS and TBS Sport, um, who were all working in very integrated partnership uh, to pull off delivering all of the content, all of the time. This was the first Olympics that we've been involved in that delivered all of the content. So if you wanted to see anything, you could see it. Some of it did get was was available only online, but you could get to everything if you wanted it while it was live. So this was a very simple breakdown of um, what the main net daily broadcast hours are in relation to the clock in Sochi and the clock at home. Um, so uh, most ambitious winter games ever. There were 36 events at night in Sochi compared to nine uh, hockey events in Vancouver. And there were 40 more hours of coverage overall. Um, so this is a breakdown of how um, hours had changed um, between the different Olympics and how many hours were broadcast. Um, we've just kind of shown this to show the difference of, we did it with less, but we had to do a lot more hours of programming, um, whether it be to live network TV or content that was to the web, which was all produced um, with at least play-by-play -play in color. Um, more streaming than ever before. It was an interesting stat that was presented to us uh, before we started figuring out how we're going to pull this all off. Was that when when this nation did Vancouver, the iPad didn't exist. It came out just shortly after that. So there's the amount of consumption and resources and pull on that straw for the uh, for the mobile device has obviously exploded. So we wanted a really strong resource that was not going to fail, it was going to be robust. Um, so we went out and we partnered with that, but it was a very integrated partnership. Um, and all of our sub-licensees were included in that. Every service came back to the, either this facility or the Montreal facility and was included back in the app live, real time. Um, <clears throat> we had full radio programming um, from Sochi. We still maintained our radio studios in Sochi. A lot of, as many of you know, a lot of our production technical resources have all moved home. And everything in Sochi is essentially a conduit to get it back. For radio, it's so integrated. And as you know, so many reporters are the tech that's feeding. And it still made sense to send the radio facilities there. So we had built two in the IBC, within our space, we built two uh, radio studios for live production um, and they were able to also bring things back from the different venues in the coastal cluster and the mountain cluster back to that space or bring it right home. So to give you a bit of an idea um, if you had your TV off all through the Olympics um, there was two 
it was a really great games for us as, uh, on the technical side because everything was really centralized. There was really only two spaces that were all within walking distance. So you had the mountain cluster down here and we had a coastal cluster. And within those spaces, the connectivity and the ability to walk between them and move things around and solve problems and logistics was really great because if you had been spread out all over you know, that whole region, it would have been awful. Um, so logistically, it was really nice that way. And we could turn to OBS and be like, well, we need this, and it wasn't on their plan. Well, there was a chance they could make it happen. Um, <clears throat> so at each one of these locations, we had um, unilateral facilities, um, as well as our multilateral services coming back. Um, one venue that's not on here is right here, you'll see a photo later on, is for our news deployment for both French and English, um, Newsnet and RDI. We deployed two fully equipped broadcast studios um, with direct connectivity home, which we'll get into later, but the two living 24-hour news service deployments there that came back uh, directly to Montreal and Toronto. In the <coughs> mountain cluster, we didn't deploy our resources as heavily. We uh, spent our money wisely based on what we were gambling on results for athletes that we had great hopes for. It paid off in a lot of cases. Um, we didn't spend heavily at Alpine, and we got a medal. So there was a scramble. So you, sometimes you, you make a risk, and uh, it worked out for us most of the time. Um, but you also, we did partnerships with people like the BBC, who did spend heavily at Alpine, and you can do a quick trade. So those are kind of the venues and the breakdown of the spaces. The IBC was located um, about a nine iron from all those buildings in the coastal cluster, unless it's Brian's nine iron. Um, the, uh, the IBC was an unbelievable building um, that wasn't really ready for us as broadcasters when we arrived. Um, power was a major issue. Uh, heating and ventilation was another issue. Um, it was either freezing cold or really hot. Um, <clears throat> these are some of our team members in our IBC space building. Um, all our, this is the early crew that went in to build all our technical facilities and our connectivity home. This is sort of just the beginning of figuring out where are we going to put chairs and tables and all that stuff. Just showing it was a very small team and how integrated every single process and step was uh, to get us there. Um, the set in Sochi. Uh, was in Sochi, which um, was a debate. So we had three studios in Sochi. We had a dedicated English studio, a dedicated French studio, and then we partnered with Radio Canada to create a studio in the middle that we could book based on our requirements through the day. So in the English studio, we had three cameras which came directly back home. In the French studio, the same. And then in the shared studio, we had two cameras, and both of those cameras came back to both cities so that any producer that wanted to get into that space at whatever time based on you know a French athlete did something and they want to spend a lot more time they could book that space and do an offline record or an interview while their main set was still hot doing content. Um, we uh, One fun thing we did is over the shoulder there, this was a mock-up of it when it was still in our studios here when we built it, is we wanted um, facilities in Sochi were not set up so that you could have the beautiful window out on the plaza, unless of course you're MDC and you own park. Um, so we took some Panasonic TVs and built them as though a window and it worked out really well. We kept the same shot in it all the time. We never broke the illusion. And many people would say that it lived the whole time. It worked out really well. Uh, they're really good quality monitors. If we'd ever lost the signal, the illusion would have evaporated very fast, but another risky take. <laughs> yeah, so our, our mandate the entire time that we did this was uh, after the production plan was kind of more or less crystallized, use that lightly, uh, was use what you have and do it fast. We were kind of late to the game. Um, most of the uh, planning deadlines from OBS had already passed and we were really behind the ball on a lot of stuff. So that ended up do it fast. Use what you have came from, we had a large infrastructure of gear from past special events from Torino and uh, we wanted to leverage as much of that as possible. 
So those were, on the technical side, our two kind of driving mandates. I went the wrong way. Uh, so evolution of an idea. We started on napkins, as most of us do, uh, whiteboarded all kinds of different ideas, and um, had a load of arguments. Uh, we, we had discussions. Yeah. Brian and I are kind of famous around the building. Brian and I work together almost every day and have for the last two years. Uh, but Brian and I probably have about seven arguments a day. And, but they're all fairly constructive. And then we took this to a bigger scale and we involved all of our partners in Montreal uh, and here. And there was a ton of back and forth and discussion and debate about where do we take risks, where do we take chances, where do we try new things, and where do we utilize equipment that we've already used and trust and know, um, and how do we deploy it in a smart way. So it, it really developed into a great um, relationship between all those people, especially between our partners in, in Montreal. I don't think we have a, a phenomenal track record for always communicating back and forth, and there's a ton of ideas in both regions. And on this project, it really came together. Uh, I can say like I was fully involved on both sides and looked after both uh, groups. And um, the benefits that came out of that were phenomenal. It really paid. So as we uh, as we worked through all the old gear that we had, um, we not quickly, but came to the realization that uh, a lot of the old gear wouldn't bring us to the location that we wanted to be in uh, technically for the games. So we started looking at existing infrastructure that we have throughout the throughout the country uh, for things like transport, standards conversion, um, frame sync all that kind of stuff, uh, and audio transport. This was the first game that we did totally in 5.1, uh, which was a big undertaking. Um, but we came up with solutions that kind of suited all those technical challenges, which you'll see coming up. Our big win was our transmission plan. So we have a, a next generation converge network, um, something our telecom team deployed a few years back uses Everts ATPs, uh, Everts' ATP platform, uh, J2, J2K encoders and decoders, and uh, spans our entire country. We took the same kind of idea, and um, we called OBS and asked them, instead of a traditional Vanda, which I'll get Rob to explain, um, we <coughs> bought telecom services from them. Um, so, Vanda. So, to break it down a little bit, a traditional Vanda is uh, video and audio lines back from whatever venue. So typically at, at any venue, we'll take um, <coughs> BIP, for example. Uh, BIP was the Bolschlei Ice Palace, which is where we hosted hockey from. Uh, for Traditionally, for a CBC broadcast from hockey, we'd need 7 million video lines and 27 million audio lines because they want to do it like we do hockey night in Canada every Saturday night. So. Um, and then at every one of those locations, you would need those resources going back and forth. Sochi is a 50 hertz environment. That would have meant that everything that we did at the venues, we needed to live in 50 hertz. And we needed to do our audio um, in a traditional way. So I'll let you get into the gigi part of it. Right, so we, we, we decided what's the best way to kind of tackle this. We had multiple calls with OBS and we asked them, can we have a 60 hertz island passing through your system uh, in your MCR? And the quick answer back was no, because they monitor everything in their, in their location and it wouldn't work for them. So we were at a standstill. We, we didn't want to shoot in 50, needing more standards conversion wherever we put that story to come. Um, but we also didn't want to you know, move all this content in 50. So, we thought, well, we've got all this NGCN gear out in the in the field. What if we uh, what if we considered every one of these venues uh, a CBC location? Just like we look at PEI, Moncton, Calgary, Winnipeg, doesn't matter. We we decided, okay, so let's put a, a small little node out at each venue. Uh, we'll purchase a, a gig E line from uh, from OPS, which we confirmed was an Ethernet private line, so we had a full gig of bandwidth. And um, we put transmission gear right at the right at the venue. That opened up. Yeah, go. The 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 difference of that was is that traditionally we would still have to transport everything home in the old model. Everything had to come to the IBC. It was a handoff from OBS. We received it in the I, in the IBC over a whole bunch of connectivity from their uh, CER over to ours. 
Then base, we'd, band, base, base band. Base band, and then we'd have essentially the same equipment, but sitting here. So what we did was we took this gear and moved it right out to the venue and skipped the IBC altogether. And then that led to a whole host of other opportunities. Right, so the, one of the, the biggest opportunity that we had was we shot the 60 in the 50 hertz world. Uh, enhanced clear scan on the Sony camcorders that we had out there. Um, we dial out any kind of flicker and we pump our signal home in 60 hertz. <clears throat> so we, there was a lot of question and concern about whether this was going to work because the lighting system, the power system in Sochi is A, unreliable and it's a 50 hertz environment, so how much flicker are we going to have in our image? So we took all kinds of silly precautions. We sent guys in, in, in uh, Moscow to different areas and had them shoot in day and night and roll through all kinds of things. and Had them shoot a child's hockey game. Yeah, kid's <laughs> hockey game in some venue. And we did all kinds of silly things to try and mitigate our risk, I guess is the right way to say it. Um, and we also deployed all LED lighting, which we could crank up the refresh rate on really high. This meant that whatever was on the foreground of our subjects was probably going to be okay. And now we're just dialing out the background. So venue lighting, light poles in, in cities, kitchens in, in, in restaurants, whatnot. So that was one of our biggest worries going in. Not to jump too far ahead, we never heard one single word about it the whole th way through the games. There was never a single comment about flicker this, flicker that. It never came up as an issue anywhere. This was one of the number one things because we had a lot of communication with the BBC and NBC. We worked very heavily, we worked constantly with them back and forth, so they were all really anxious to know how it was going to go because to them it made total sense, but they weren't ready to make that leap. I think they are now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so with that kind of decision made, we could start investigating other things that having a network connection out at every venue gave you. Uh, traditionally, we'd have a whole bunch of four-wire circuits that came back to the IBC for communications. And we would dump a frame in the IBC and either an entire matrix, intercom matrix, or if we could use a, a Toronto or Montreal matrix, we'd need a whole bunch of connectivity there. Uh, we decided to use Arbonne out at every venue and utilize the matrices in Toronto and Montreal. And we didn't deploy an intercom matrix in the IBC. Uh, so everything ran off of Studio 42. And the studio in Montreal. And the studio in Montreal. Um, to our line connection here, which was blazingly fast and crystal clear. Uh, that, was the, that was the first thing that yeah, all the, the talent noticed. The Arvon model was a, a huge success. The delay was unbelievable. Like, it was non-existent. The talent was, uh, was raving about it. Um, to the point that the, the very first night that Ron went on air, which was pre-games, uh, we got to sit in the control room and, and watch him get ready and warm up and communicate because he went live with Hockey Night in Canada was the first thing we did a full week before the Olympics. And during his banter back and forth with the producers, he took his entire opening segment and trashed it because he wanted to talk about how phenomenal the back and forth delay was. So he talked about the difference between all the games that he had done to what it was now. And for Brian and I, that was pretty rewarding moment. There's just two of us in the back of the studio and nobody else is there with two beers watching this go down and hearing him banter about this before he goes on air. So that part was a real reward. It was good. That was great. Uh, other things that it let us do at the venue is file. So we now had CBC network connectivity out there so we could file file based uh, right from the venue instead of you know reporters having to come back. In the, the Sochi model that's not such a big deal since our coastal cluster was so tightly packed but in future models where you might be in the rainforest, it might be a really good thing to have. Um, the other great thing is we had CBC phones out at the out of the venue uh, with local extensions, which was great. I mean, anything that you can think of that you can put on a on a network, we could have out at the venue. Anything that can live in this building that talks to our network, we could deploy there and manage it from here. And that was the win. And we monitor could, it. We could monitor it and manage it, which meant that we could utilize individuals here. Mm -hmm. The office space here, the people that get to live in their own homes, the cost of traveling, hotel, all of that. It just, the domino effect of simplicity begins to grow. As, as every day we looked at this, we'd find something else that made sense to us. Halfway through the games, we were getting some, not even halfway, a, a little bit sooner than halfway, 
we had people plugging cameras in with the wrong settings and my control would just pop up on the rotor that we had plugged into and we're like, oh, you're in. It's not working. We could tell exactly. You're in the wrong format, change your camera. Okay, well, now it works, it was great. Um, so that kind, of, that kind of visibility into your system, 8,000 kilometers away, was, was a real win. Uh, moving from the, the venues back to the IBC, um, we tried some other stuff. Uh, Ebert's just came out with a Matty card. Um, and one of the big things that we end up having to pump back is a whole bunch of commentary audio. Uh, this game's, we embedded it all in our video signals returning home. Uh, but we ran a simultaneous test using MADI infrastructure. Uh, the hope being that OBS would just hand us a fiber with all of our commentary on it. We would plug it into our transport system and bring it home to Toronto and Montreal. Uh, Which we did in redundancy and it was a full success. And it was a full success. We, you know, the, the timing issues that might arise from transporting your audio and video separately, um, not that big a deal when we're talking about commentary audio over a host signal. Very rarely do you see your commentary uh, personnel on top of your host signal in that kind of uh, environment. For all of our unilateral positions, we embedded right at the source to ensure that there was no lip flap whatsoever. Um, coming home, the multis. So the, the multilateral feeds that got dumped off from OBS, uh, traditional baseband delivery from the, from the, uh, from the host broadcaster, um, for anyone who's not aware, multilateral is the what we would call true line cut provided to you as a rights holder by OBS. So for every sport, venue, discipline, there's a multilateral signal that comes that many countries take right to air, um, just to give some perspective. And Rod's got a great video at the end that shows how we use unilateral coverage versus multilateral coverage to create our show. Um, then whatever small... Uh, space that we had in the IBC, uh, our studio cameras, our voiceover booths, um, and any kind of office feed slash stand-up position that we might have had at the IBC, we put into our, our system, our ATP platform, and it was uh, it came home along with all the multicasted video that we did not open at the IBC. It just passed straight through as data and, and came home. Uh, we used the J2K encoders. Uh, we didn't use the low latency versions; so they're the the one version behind. But uh, we had, and it was super fast. The, the latency between Toronto and Sochi on the network, I think, was 80 milliseconds. Uh, a little bit more to get out to the venue, and our encoders added, I want to say, 40, but I don't remember. So don't ask that question at the end. Um, and we moved that home, and then we chose, uh, once we get home, what to decode. Um, with the multilateral signals, do you want to go into the standards conversion right away? Sure. Is there something you want to add? No. With the, with the multilateral um, signals, which were in 50, we had to make a decision. So we had to frame rate convert those. Um, we needed them in 60. We didn't want to. Sometimes we used to. In the past, we used to convert our entire plant over to 50 hertz, uh, and we would standards convert on the way out. Uh, we didn't want to do that because we're integrated so much these days that we want to share with, uh, with digital and with all, all kinds of people. We want to archive it in 60, so when we bring things back, we don't have to transcode them. Uh, so we decided to stay in 60, and now we need to decide where we put our frame rate conversion. Uh, frame rate conversion is the most expensive thing. Yeah, it was used. really expensive. Um, so we had a decision to make. We could put it in the IBC. Uh, shipping time was three, four months? Three months each way. Three months each way. So that would add six months of rental to your contract. That's not cool. At $40,000 a month for the expensive ones. Um, so what we decided to do was uh, move the standards conversion back home. Um, despite having to dual encode, we chose to put it in Toronto for frame syncing reasons. No other reason besides that. There's, there's no political reason. Um, so we put the put the signals into our router. We frame rate converted them, and uh, then we re-encoded them and sent the 60 hertz signal back to Montreal, uh, giving them full access to all the 60 hertz signals. Um, reduced insurance, reduced shipping time. Uh, that still wasn't good enough, though. So what we decided to do was take a tiered approach at standards conversion. Uh, we had a shootout here. And by good enough, he means good enough for. Yeah. 
Uh, we had a shootout here. Uh, a couple of producers came in, took a look at them. Um, I didn't notice much of a difference, but I guess I have terrible eyes. They noticed a difference, so we used some expensive ones, some less expensive ones. And then for the stuff that didn't really move all that much uh, in the background, mm -hmm. we used really inexpensive ones um, that we used for curling, stand-up positions, <coughs> and things of that nature that were orders of magnitude cheaper than the other frame rate converters made. And which in the end excelled. Yeah, they were great. They were phenomenal. We by accident put some stuff into one and nobody knew. <laughs> by accident. Um, so uh, then we decoded uh, everything else. Everything that you see in blue is kind of something that would be decoded in both cities. It's hard to tell from back there probably. Anything that you see in black was decoded only in their respective cities. And the stuff that's in red was 50 hertz. But so, as you can see, we, we had a ton of feeds coming back. So to give you an idea, in Montreal, we had uh, 38 decodes of signals that either they kind of got them from Toronto because we re-encoded for them, or they came directly from the IBC or directly from the venue. Um, they re-encoded 17 signals that went back to Sochi for re returns or feeds to the IBC, uh, mostly returns. Um, and in Toronto, we had similar numbers, uh, 38, but we had a lot more um, encodes because we re-encoded to send everything back to Montreal. And another thing that we tried to look at a little bit was we'd like to get rid of some of those returns and employ some IP stuff out of the, out of the venue for less real-time uh, broadcast stuff. Uh, so if they just want to watch something, we don't want to burn a, a JPEG 2000 path. We'd rather just put in an inexpensive IP return. Um, there was a lot of this. This document became this ever-growing, evolving thing. But the thing that kept growing for us is, anytime somebody wanted to do something, the very first question out of Brian's mouth or mine was, "Well, can you do it over IP, or can you control it over IP, or does it have a port? Can we do that? Well, does it have an RJ45 connection on it? Do I have to stand next to the equipment to use it? Yeah. And if if any time you could find a device that could do it, then we could figure out a solution. And Every time we went through that exercise, we had significant success. We did have a safety net that we deployed at BIP. Obviously, hockey is our number one sport in this country, so we did deploy some traditional um, services from OBS that if something were to happen to our gig -E connections, if the service from the telecom there or OBS was not as reliable as advertised, we still could have at least brought a Canadian flavor to the hockey broadcast um, and delivered a show. All of many people would say that there is a lot of risk to the Gigi connectivity in doing it the first time. Our redundancy was not in technology. Our redundancy was that on all of the multilateral feeds, so all of these multi feeds, we had already taken the commentators and married them to the multilateral feed with OBS. So we used OBS's. Com, com boxes and they married it. So even if we lost all of our venue resources, our unilateral services, our gig -E connectivity, it's, we still would have had our commentators and our Canadian call with our Canadian flavor talking about our athletes. So that's where our insurance sat. So really a summary of everything we just talked about. Um, OBS is a next generation service provider you know, telco instead of video services. Uh, IP communication, telephony, intercom, file delivery, shooting in your whatever flavor you'd like because you control the pipe. And our backup being the host multilateral over top of our unilateral. This, um, I go back. this just gives you an idea. So obviously at each one of those rings we had to have some equipment. So this is a little bit bigger than most of them. This is the one that lived at our new studio, which had a lot more resources in it. But it was very simple, like a switch, some Everts equipment in a frame, um, uh, Arvon 8 panel, or some of them just, you could deploy a KP32 that was Arvon enabled. Um, and that was it. Everything else just sort of fed off of that. And the cameras. And the cameras. Uh, standards conversion, we talked about, we used Snell and 4A. Uh, remote management and control, this was one of the things that we found was a big win. In fact, we ended up building a little 
this cubby in the back of the control room. This was something that grew that we, we kind of knew we would need a space to work. Um, I was in Sochi for the beginning of our deployment and then came home to help manage bouncing between Montreal and Toronto. And very quickly we realized that we could see everything. There wasn't anything that we couldn't see. But at the IBC, there was now things they couldn't see because the unilaterals don't open there anymore. The service comes directly home. So now if you're a reporter and you decided you weren't gonna go over to hear the interviews at X or Y, now you can't sit in the IBC and see it because it doesn't stop there anymore. So back at home, we, all of our crew reported back to us that they felt much more connected to Brian and I or whoever was on the resource desk in whatever control room or the news resource desk than they did to the people that were actually there at our main facility at the IBC. Because we were talking to them, we could tell when their cameras weren't set up right, we could see when they plugged in. We could switch their routers. We could switch their routers for them. You know, if they knew that they couldn't get from point A to B to get back and switch it, we could just switch it for them. Um, so this pod that you see over there was this ever-evolving thing that we kept building more multi-views and connectivity and control. Um, purely out of, we didn't anticipate how much control and how much ability we had to monitor everything that was going on um, in one spot. In Toronto, uh, it was use what you have. This was, we really embraced our use what you have here. Um, all our existing Avid infrastructure, all our existing EBS infrastructure, uh, both news and, and post. Uh, we used two control rooms. Uh, one, our main control room, Studio 42, and a primetime control room, 40, which we also used for sub-licensee production during odd hours. We also used 43, which is not on here for sub-licensee production as well. Um, we partnered with Delta Trade for our sports, or for our online, as, as Rob mentioned. Uh, we'd go to a presentation for our, our baseband channels and also some digital stuff and radio. Uh, airspeed, XT3s, all the, all the you know, usual suspects here. Um, IPD on the EBS side. And we pioneered, for us, uh, something in the Avid land, which was uh, Interplay Central. Uh, now called Media Central. Uh, we had great success with that uh, throughout the games. Our sub-licensees would uh, cut stuff and push things to airspeed for playout or file transfer. I'm not sure they used that once, but it was available. Um, and we shot listed everything in, I'm gonna keep on calling it IPC because that's what it was then, uh, in Interplay Central. Uh, so it's a, a web browser for those who aren't familiar with uh, Interplay Central, a web browser based uh, client for our interplay system. Uh, all the feeds came in on lots, 30 something airspeeds. Um, and as the feed was coming in, you could real time log uh, all the, the video that was coming in uh, just by hitting Control M, typing in what you wanted, and it was available for everybody in the system. Uh, we had 12 shot listers working on that and a whole bunch of people in digital and content that were also contributing to the system. So there was a ton of information in the system for people to use. Well, I skipped a slide. So audio, <laughs> does that skip the G? I don't think so. Okay, good. Uh, so that's the, that's the <laughs> hardcore Toronto stuff that we, were, we used. Um, audio was a big thing for us. We did, we demoed Maddie back from the, the venue, but we used Maddie for uh, sharing between a lot of our venues, or, sorry, a lot of our studios. Uh, instead of running a lot of cable, ADS, or analog back and forth between between studios, we ran a couple fibers, plugged it into a, an inexpensive MADI router, which worked fantastic. And we could now almost give a menu of MADI lines uh, to each control room of whatever they wanted that was in that router, which, which worked out great. The other big thing, and the reason that Andrew is running a console with his foot, is we did it in 5.1. So lots and lots and lots and lots of audio. Uh, we were in all of our edit suites, upgrading everything so that they could listen to all that, and um, we needed outboard boards to uh, track all the various XT3s or airspeeds that we would play content back on from the studio. Anything else? Uh, CG. Um, the CG I think was also kind of uh, not ambitious, but it was it was really cool. We deployed um, all of our Viz infrastructure 
to do our main branding in Toronto. Um, and out at the sub-licensees, we had a ticker element and in Toronto that was S SMT, SMT uh, delivered that. Uh, all controlled from Toronto and, and from this building uh, via IP. Uh, we also integrated some Arvon out at the, the sub-licensees as well so we could talk to them. Montreal. So this is just a breakdown of how the Montreal segment uh, worked, uh, their Trinic system, <coughs> News ISIS, and how they moved content around. They had uh, a group of, where we were more Avid heavy, they were more EVS heavy just due to the nature of, um, of how they produce content and how they consume their content. Um, it was a better <coughs> workflow for them. Um, one thing that uh, subjective thing that came out of this for me is um, we are one network but they produce their content in, and consume it differently than we do and we had to learn that so that we can understand how they need to use their hardware differently. They they naturally enjoy a longer um, longer play content and just speak to it whereas we tend to cut it up a thousand times and move it all around and heavy edit um, so the EVS was a great workflow for them, and it was hard for me to wrap my head around that for a while. Of, that it would be more efficient to do it in the Avid. But after spending more and more time with them, you can see that their content, how they um, affect it truly is different. So it was a, a better workflow for them. They had a 200 terabyte X store for the EVS, which managed all of their content for the entire games. So everything was in one location. And then they had some processes for moving it to edit and to other places. <coughs> Some gear racked in Toronto. Uh, the one thing I'd like to point out here probably is uh, BBM. So we separately encoded uh, all of our digital offerings with uh, main and backup encoders, but every channel had a unique code on it that we could track our digital services separate from our <coughs> traditionally broadcast services. Uh, this gave our resellers.